You know what? I've just screwed up this entire intro. Let's start again. <laughs> Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I'm going to have a discussion with Malazan author Ian C. Esselmont. Hello, Cameron. How are you doing today? Hello, AP. Nice to see you. Thank you for the opportunity. And regular viewers of this channel will realize that once again, as, as Cameron and I try to have a discussion because of time zones and uh, internet gremlins, Cam is seeing me as a partially pixelated blur on his screen. And that's what I'm getting on his on this end and recording on my computer. So we are going to do our best. The connection is once again, for whatever reason, a bit wonky. But today we wanted to talk about magic. Uh, magic in the Malazan uh, role-playing game and how it evolved and, and things like that. because. I had a previous discussion with Steven Erickson and clearly Steve is a liar and doesn't know what he's talking about. So the best way to correct that is to speak to Ian C. Esselmont, the co-creator of the world. So Cam, mm. <laughs> Steve's going to kill me. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm here to clean up. Uh... And to uh, set the record straight, because some other guy went off on this topic who didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> no, uh, to set the record straight, I am not here to rebut or correct Stephen in any uh, form or manner. I'm, I'm here just to offer up another um, entree to, to, the, uh, to the world. Well, be before we get started this, I probably should point out, because not everyone who is going to see this video will have watched the other videos and realized that you, Steve, me, we are friends and, and we like ribbing each other slightly. We, we, are, we are perfectly respect, uh, respectful to Mr. Erickson when it is called for, but, but when he's not here, we're going to have jokes at his expense. <laughs> so it... If, if I have this right, you were gaming before Steve. You, you started out mm. uh, role-playing gaming before Steve. And I have the impression, either rightly or wrongly, that you were more familiar with uh, gaming as a sort of concept, the, the rule books and, and all of those sorts of things that you introduced them to. Um, generally, I see, yeah, you could say that I've been gaming since I was in high school uh, and uh, for, for a number of years before I met Steve. And then I introduced him to D&D uh, &D at that time, AD&D. &D, uh, and uh, we started gaming for, on that platform uh, just, just as a, um, a frame for our world creation. <laughs> no. I, actually, you might be able to answer this for me. In in AD and D, because I'm I'm obviously much more familiar with Forgotten Realms as a rule set rather than AD and D as the the sort of the core. Because it was there was Greyhawk, was it Greyhawk? Um, Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, D D, and then AD and D. Right, uh, but you then then you ended up with Forgotten Realms and uh, Kryn, the Dragonlance world, uh, Ravenloft, which ended up in Forgotten Realms, I think. You know, there, well, there I, were... I, I, lose, I lose track after that. <clears throat> and so I, I think, was the rule set for AD&D that you were using, was it formalized in terms of like the names of the gods and, and that sort of thing? Or was it a general rule set for um, fill in your own thing? Like, was the world filled in in AD&D? &D? Um, originally, no. Um, and, and here is where editing is great because I can show you a cover. I'll just go get it. I can see it from here. Old school gamers will, will be 
familiar with this cover. Oh yeah. This um, is the the and and it's not even an addition. This is like 1976. So there was no of uh, V1, V2, V3. This is prior to all of that. And that's where uh, this is the frame that I was gaming from. Uh, and um, it's um, just um, a magic system. There's no um, uh, broader context of what became gods and demigods, I think was the original book that dealt with those, dealt with it, it provided a, a guide to various mythologies. You had Norse, Greek, et cetera, et cetera, um, Mesoamerican, Indian, um, and um, they had a sampling of uh, <clears throat> possible frameworks for mythologies for, for, for gamers if they wanted to go into those milieus. So with that, if uh, like going by that rule book, um, was that carved up into like the magic was the school of divination could do this thing, the school of evocation could do this thing, or was it if you're using magic, these are the things that you can do? Well, I'm not, um, you know, I don't have this uh, all in the top of my head, but um, it wasn't divided, it was you were just a magic user, and the spells were categorized, you could have a like they might have a a, um, a frame for them. Like this was this is a divination spell, yeah. or this is an evocation spell. Or this is a summoning, uh, and those were just categories of spells. And but you were a magic user, and if you could potentially you could learn any any one of them. So it wasn't divided up at that time. And what it then did was it said this was a, like a level one spell. This was a level two spell. This was a level three spell, and you were allowed to memorize. A certain number of of each level each day that's that's yeah. how it worked wasn't it yeah yep yeah. and that was across the board for illusionists and for druids and for clerics it was the same kind of a frame <clears throat> okay so how do you move from that uh into gurps like what was that transition kind of like because you transition from AD&D um, well, to, to GURPS. Yeah. By that point, by, by the point we got to that, several years in, uh, we had already dispensed with a regular framework, and we were just sort of doing whatever the hell we wanted. Um, um, and because um, when uh, Steve came in uh, he, and, and was... was um, GMing and running things, um, he wasn't so interested, in, and neither was I, in um, squeezing, you know, like looking at systems and finding their weaknesses and exploiting them. And that kind of fact, that's a very um, a wargaming mechanical approach. Uh, we were more interested in the, the myths, the mythos, and the, the concepts behind them. Uh, and so um, the, um, what we, we will explain these terms, but what we talk about in terms of hard magic system or soft magic system, we were moving away from, um, an, an origin, at least in my part, in a regimented hard, harder system towards a much softer system. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the, the things that's obviously interesting is you, you can think of, um, now I hesitate to use the term ludic narrative because that was already coined for something else. Uh, but a role playing game as both ludic, as in game, but also narrative, story. And it is a blend of both, but quite often will lean closer to one as the focus that is supported by the other. So quite often you can have a style of gaming that is using aspects of the mechanics to propel the narrative. And other times it's suffering through the narrative to mess around with the mechanics. It, it just depended on your, your particular focus in your own particular gaming group. So you had the, the concept of 
min-maxing? What stats could you dump, get rid of, because they weren't necessary for the function and role of your character, and then maximize the stats for those things that they were doing? So making a, a really powerful, um, healthy warrior and making them as dumb as a post because you weren't using them to solve puzzles with their brains. They were solving it with their big sword. Um, why spend a lot of your precious statistic points on a wizard's strength when they're not going to be punching people in the face? Get rid of their strength and have them focus on their intelligence or their wisdom or whatever stat was being used for that particular function for the role that they were playing. So that, that was one way of playing. And of course, the other way was, yeah, but I want a dumb wizard because I think it's going to be hilarious. <laughs> and yes, I mean, in, in this is what I meant about uh, exploiting the system. If in, in some gaming approaches, you could do that and you could have a, uh, a dumb warrior. But the problem was, is uh, very often the player wouldn't play them that way. So you would have someone who's supposed to be, you know, a, extremely dumb, but the person ru uh, running the character isn't playing them that way, just dispenses with that as a, whereas um, Steve and I are much more character driven uh, and, and we wanted to play characters and the characters dr drove the, um, their, their strengths and weaknesses of, of that character. Yeah, because it's, it, it, it's one of those things that say uh, you, you create a character and you go, they have very low intelligence. And then the player goes, oh, but that's an orc and they are, or that's a troll and they're weak to fire. And they're going to, your character doesn't know that. And they're metagaming. They're, they're using knowledge from outside the diegesis, extra diegetic information to inform their character's actions. And, you know, it brings in a whole load of things about levels of knowledge and uh, you can actually make analogies to point of view and style of narrator and all that sort of stuff about where the knowledge is coming from and, and who, is, uh, who is directing it. But in, in that sense, the, the player is more a puppet master, whereas uh, you can have players who are like, no, I'm going to be my character and sort of, as we are playing, pretend that I am actually there and in it. And it's a much more immersive experience, but it's slightly different. Yeah, and much more challenging. I mean, um, you, you know, if you're playing someone who's a quote unquote, you know, dumb character, you have to keep your mouth shut. Uh, you have to, uh, even when you want to say certain things, it's, um, it's much more of a challenge. To, or or to, to turn them into way. a politician. <laughs> you, could, you could just have them play. And yeah. well, our, or conversely, you have a, a, a wizard who has, you know, a huge stat for his intelligence, but I'm sorry to say you're not that smart. <laughs> How do you play someone who's smarter than you are? <laughs> but weirdly enough, that is that is one of those issues that I think writers sometimes get into. And like, obviously there, there are tricks around it because you're in control of the entire narrative universe. But trying to write a character who is smarter than you is actually incredibly difficult. <laughs> because if they were smarter than you, they would have done things differently. <laughs> Quite so, yeah. That's a challenge. So you you were in in AD and D, and then you moved to GURPS. So when when was the Malazan sort of world created? Was that still while it was in AD and D? Um, a lot of the um, physical set setting, maps, um, races, cultures, all that was set out while we were still mostly using the AD and D uh, system. Um, but, you know, it, I wouldn't say it was constrained by it. it that was just um, a convenient uh, frame uh, for the world building. And then you you change the the gaming system to AD&D, or sorry, to GURPS, but you yes. ported it across. You just went, well, well, we'll carry on using the settings that we've already built and we'll just change slightly how people do things in the world. Yeah. Pretty much. And it, it wasn't, and again, we were like very much free forming. Um, it, um, we sort of 
uh, knew beforehand who would say win a battle based on the relative strengths of the of the two opposing sides you know who, who was in a stronger position who was in a weaker position who had inspired leadership who who did not who had better logistical support <laughs> etc that would determine pretty much who won the battle not the role of a uh, of a dice so. or or a single character you know it's or a single character yeah, yeah. so but it, from previous conversations that that we've had it's um there were times that you were very focused down in what the specific character was doing and then what you've just talked about there is like a grand scale battle so for instance if um the emperor summoned the talana mass that that obviously heavily weighted things in his favor because he had an undead army at his disposal which grants him a huge amount of power in a, in a large-scale battle but that's well very... who, who may or may not even do what he wants <laughs> well that was a check and balance you put on it to stop it being a simple hand wave i win or you know a big red win button um but that that's a very different type of aspect of the gaming that you did than you know the the classic story that you were telling about running around in the uh, the castle uh, with a, a mage fight between one character and a demon which you know is right down there in single person yeah and even that um the rules were sort of went away at, at that point because we were having so much fun and so well Sorry, but that character, say an early uh, uh, Kelliman, Wu, uh, only had three spells, right? And so the fight would be over pretty quickly. Uh, the run the, well, not a fight, a duel. Uh, and and uh, it would be over pretty quickly, and that would be that. So we just said, well, he just keeps making illusions, just keeps, keeps changing the illusion. And even though the duration of that spell has already passed, you know factually speaking but no we kept the illusion up and and uh because it was entertaining and uh we wanted to see how far we could take it and, and push it yeah and i suppose that's again it's part of this difference of are you are you serving the story and the experience of the story by ignoring the duration room um because in a narrative, again, you could say, oh, well, the, uh, the castle was made of a specific material that allowed illusions to linger so much longer than before. You know, you, you can add in an exclusion to a rule. It can be built into the narrative. And if you do it smoothly enough, or if you foreshadow that such a thing can happen, um, then in a novel, you can drop in some information about th this strange material. And then later on, when you have that scene, because you want to extend the duration, you've already figured, or you've already dropped in the breadcrumbs for that. And so when you break the rule that has already been established, the exception to the rule has already been introduced and explained, and a reader is more willing to go along with it. So it's not just going, no rules apply. It's being aware that you are breaking one of the rules and trying to figure out a way to incorporate that. Well, <clears throat> no rules apply. The rule that applies is, um, as you said, does it serve the narrative? That's the overriding rule, right? Does it uh, forward the narrative? Does it strengthen it, deepen it? Um, and so, for example, Steve was running that particular moment. Um, he was playing the demon. Uh, at, at GMing against my um, illusionist. He's an illusionist who was pretending to be a magic user. Everyone thought he was a magic user, but he was actually an illusionist pretending to be a magic user. <laughs> <laughs> and none of his spells had any, any real effect, but everyone thought he was a magic user, and so they believed them. And, uh, <clears throat> so any, anyway, uh, I think from a rules point of view, the demon uh, was enjoying this so much that he allowed it to continue. And he was uh, may perhaps lending 
his pro powers to Wu so that he could uh, continue to chase him around the the the, the corridors. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and um yeah and and that demon actually later on became twist um the well i i think in part this always reminds me of that expression about the making of sausages that you don't want to see how sausages and laws are actually made exactly yes. you don't, yeah you don't want to open that door and peek in there yeah and you know obviously part of the problem i have is like a lot of what i talk about on my channel is exposing how the sausage is actually made but when it comes to the finished product, when we are when we are reading a story, we haven't seen all of this messing around and the tinkering with things. And oh well, that rule's not inconvenient. I'm gonna have to think of a way around this. And how much of that do I put in? How much do I excuse? How much? How much am I going to make explicit? How much is going to be implicit? That these are all questions that the author wrestles with before it gets to the finished product, before we get to see the the, the final thing. Um, talking through a lot of this stuff conceptually and the, the workings out of this is showing a lot of these inner workings and, and exposing the artificiality of narrative. Because one thing we always forget when we read, because it f well written stories feel so authentic and real to us, it is all entirely artificial it is all created it is all contrived it is an illusion of authenticity yeah yeah and and what we're moving towards i think is um approaches and uh, uh versions of world building right? and like the frames underneath the world building what are you going what are you emphasizing and and uh, what um particular architecture is that world being built out of and what are your emphases and uh, what what's your goal what uh, what are your goals for this world where, where do you want to take it and that all uh, determines a lot of what we're talking about I think yeah so when it, when it came to constructing the mythology the mythos uh, the warrants uh, the the gods the hierarchy everything that was going to be the sort of the metaphysical, frame for how magic would function in the Malazan world. Can, can you remember any of that process and about how it developed? Well, um, one of the earliest manuscripts that um, Steve showed me, he already had uh, these uh, portals and, and uh, people moving from um, one physical reality to another. Um, and like what you almost call them like, you know, parallel dimensions of worlds that you can move from one to the other. So he had that and, and was playing with that. Um, and then um, my um, in, inspiration or what I did a riff on, I think was Zelezny's um, Amber series. Um, and there <clears throat> you can... Um, move from move between worlds simply by imagining their and anticipating their characteristics and saying oh rem remember there should be a stream here and then you go along and you're walking you're moving physically and then you come to that stream and and etc and you're using um the, the foci for this for cards uh and so i i had that in the back of my mind uh, and I, so we wanted to combine a lot of different influences into the system that that we were searching for that would serve our purposes uh, best. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think one thing we should probably make very, very clear, we're talking about the transition in, in the gaming. And obviously, when it came to creating the novels, uh, the screenplay and the novels that uh, both you and Erickson wrote, that while the gaming formed a lot of the foundations, things were changed for the novels because the novels had to be their own thing. So they took inspiration from, they, they tweaked things, they discarded things, they omitted things, they added things because the novels were not the write-ups of what happened in, the, in a game. They 
might have contained elements of and elements of the the world that you had developed, but the novels were in and of themselves a a literary creation, not a ludic creation. Would that be fair to say? Um, I, yeah, they they weren't themselves ludic, in, but in as much as we were playing, you know, the authors playing with text. There's a there is an element of discovery there, and and oh. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would be Cameron dropping from the call. I'll see if I can get him back. So you you may have noticed there was a slight break there. Um, technical difficulties. But I, I think we were talking about Ludic and the sort of the game mechanics versus uh, the narrative drive and how magic and, and all of these different elements, both you and Ericsson, viewed as long as it served the narrative that was the guiding principle not oh but this rule exists i have to i have to make sure to adhere to the rule yeah i mean i i think the readers are more familiar with our approach via our, our books of course and that's different the, the novels are treating this very differently uh, as you pointed out so um, I think of the contrast. Um, growing up, I remember reading the, um, for example, uh, the Dragon Riders of Pern series, right, McCaffrey. And um, there, there were very specific physical possibilities that were set up, right? Like the, these dragons could move, could teleport through mm -hmm. space and, uh, then in the later series, she started exploring the possibilities of that and its limitations, you know, um, where were they when they were in between? What was that space like? And um, so it was all driven by the capabilities of these of the dragons, right? The things that they could do, their abilities versus their limitations. Uh, and it seemed to me that that was a system in place that in many ways drove what what could be written about and what was possible in in the world and you, they, you know she could not transgress there mm -hmm. uh and and there are other similar examples but with at, by that point when we were writing novels we weren't interested in exploring the system that we had created um it became more about um I think the individualized capability of, of the characters and it was character driven. Uh, so if someone was willing to uh, sacrifice their sanity or their lives, they could accomplish things that in, in a strict, you know, rules based system might not be allowed. I, I suppose uh, in some ways, Magic in Malazan is almost equated to a, a reservoir of power. And the way that I've, I've kind of conceptualized this is if you set up a system of rules, so if you think of a massive dam with, full of water, and you go, that's the power I can access. And in order to access it safely, I can access it through this tap. And that's the amount of, you know, I use the tap, I can fill up uh, this, I can fill up that and I'm tapping into this reservoir of power. But if I was slightly more reckless, instead of using the tap, I go, well, I could just use this power hose. And yeah, I can access a lot more power. I can do powerful things with it. But you know, this is, this is more difficult to control than just turning a tap on and off. And if I was truly insane, I could go, well, I could just remove that brick from the middle of the dam and then I'd have lots of access. But then I could get swept away. And so for me, I, when I was reading the Malazan books, the, the various Warrens were very elemental themed uh, planes of existence, or at least that, it, that seemed where they sort of began as concepts. But magic itself was the leeching of this energy, this power from a different realm and manipulating it. And so how you shape and change something is going to be heavily influenced and characterized by 
who you are as a person. And like, as you said, that if you're willing to risk more, you can learn to direct more. The more you use the power holes, the more adept and good you get at using the power holes. But if you go straight from, I've just discovered this dam to removing the brick, that's the kind of mage who doesn't last very long, who just gets wiped out. Well, sure. I mean, I can see a lot. I think that really uh, works well. Um, I can't speak to Steve's approach, but um, yeah, when when I was coming at creating the, the uh, contributing to, to the uh, vi visualization of, of the Warrens, I did see them very much as separate planes of existence. And, and so you had um you know elemental night you had elemental light uh ex and and et cetera, et cetera. and these were actual physical places uh that you could travel to uh, and that's how that was my approach to uh, uh presenting them and 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 uh visualizing them and thinking about how they would work uh so that that was what maybe what i brought to 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 the uh, novels and the game um, but when you were when you were thinking about these sort of elemental planes of existence, um, obviously a number of them are associated with specific races. Um, so the the Taist Andy, the the Taist Andy are associated with dark elemental night. The um, was it curled. Cool Gale? No, uh, I think <clears throat> I don't memorize these things. <laughs> Carl Gil uh, Galean, that elemental knight. So that's associated with the the Tystanni. But it's clear that other people can use it because <clears throat> in Return of the Crimson Guard, you have a priest of night who is human accessing Carl Galean. So it's not. It, it's not intrinsic and only uh, and exclusively Tystandi that can use the realm. Does that try? Right, right. Um, this is um, a situation where uh, you, you could talk about um, proclivities, let's say. Uh, if you were Tystandi, you had a greater proclivity, you, you were more attuned to that. And so it was easier for you to access it. So like a, uh, an affinity. An affinity. And then heretofore, no human had, had done so. But eventually, one might come along who has that mindset and who finds that they can, uh, they, they have that affinity uh, and they can cultivate it if they have the opportunity and the will. So it's, um, it's you know, possible. Because it was a, an interesting thing that had come up with a conversation with, with Ericsson. And he had said, but one of the, the big things is you generally needed someone to teach you. Because while there are um, special people born with a natural affinity and a natural talent, uh, just in the same way that we have, some people just seem born to music that they could pick up any instrument and seemingly without effort just be able to play that happens but for the vast majority of people you need someone to teach you or you can spend years trying to learn an instrument and you can get pretty good at it and then someone who actually knows how to play it will come along and go if someone had taught you the fundamentals of how to do this a you would be in this position in half the time and b you wouldn't be having the problems that you have now um, yeah, so sure. when, when Erickson and I had been discussing this a, a different time, he had said that, that was one of the limitations in the world was you needed to find a teacher. And of course, if what you are teaching is the ability to manipulate pure energy and power, people can be quite selective in who they choose to share this knowledge with. So while theoretically um, a significant proportion or almost anyone on the planet could learn, A, there will be people who will always be better at it than other people because of a natural talent or proclivity. Um, 
the type of power that they naturally fall into using would be tied to an affinity but you needed to find someone who was willing to teach you those things and if you grew up in your forthcoming book i believe uh goes into a little bit about some of the the magic of an area of the world that hasn't been explicitly explored quite a lot in uh, your other novels or in in Ericsson's. And we, we get an insight into different approaches to how that magic is used. Well, you're right in, in that you have to find, sometimes find someone to, to, to actually teach you. I mean, I think of the, uh, and we, we don't even have to go too far afield to find that. Think of the guilds in of medieval times. Um, they possessed a certain amount of, of knowledge and it was important to them to guard it. And you had to become a member of the guild. You had to be allowed in before the, you know, the secrets would be revealed. Uh, and it, it was about safeguarding their, uh, their power. And so there's, a, you know, certain that applies as well. There's these considerations of not letting the, the everyone know, because then it, we would lose all of our influence and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But it, it develops a very interesting tension then, because theoretically, basically anyone on in the world could learn magic, which means as a person walking through that world, anyone you encounter could be a magic user. And that, that fundamentally shifts your perspective of other people. Because if anyone could be powerful, you have to be aware of anyone being powerful. And I think that adds to a lot of the egalitarian or uh, at least feminist aspect, equality between uh, men and women in the world. Because there cannot be an assumption of, oh, well, I'm big and strong. I can win this fight. Because the other person could just be a really powerful magic user. There was no outward sign of it. Yeah. Or pretending to be a very powerful magic <laughs> user. <laughs> uh, and it, it's one of the, the great fascinations because uh, how how magic is integrated into the secondary world is, is always a huge fascination of mine. And seeing how the ripple effects, the ramifications of introducing something like this and seeing that it has not only uh, shipped the politics, i.e. very powerful mages quite often are ruling kingdoms because they are incredibly powerful, but how it has societal implications, that there are ramifications that if someone isn't physically changed by it. It's not like as soon as you start using magic, your your eyes turn electric blue, your hair goes white. And so it's very easy to spot a magic user. And assuming if you were in a battle, it'd be very easy for a sharpshooter with a bow and arrow to take them out or a crossbow. Um, but because there aren't these physical changes, it actually has an implication on a societal level, a cultural level. And the fact that both you and Ericsson paid attention to that is, is one of the great joys of the series for me. Well, it's, it, we've, we've been using analogies like the dam and, and, and all the rest of for accessing power and, and, and energy, let's call it energy potential. Um, but there's it uh, for me, uh, and then it really uh, came down to um, willpower in that we all possess a certain amount of willpower and it's just, are you willing to, to go, you know, and, and use it and push uh, how, how far are you willing to push and how hard? Um, like uh, holding, for example, holding your hand over a candle. Um, you are, you can, you can do it, right? You can do it, but how long are you willing to do it? <laughs> and for anyone watching, don't do that. Do not don't do that over a candle. Yeah. You will get burned. Yeah. Um, and you might know that beforehand, but still do it anyway. So it's uh, uh, that's that's the willpower side of things, and the self destructiveness, and and the 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 physical damage that can come from this act, right? Uh, uh, although I don't recommend, again, I don't recommend it at all to anyone. It's just an image, and, and <laughs> yes, 
But Cameron, let me again point out, you can't say these things on the internet without making it very explicit that people should not do this. Right. Do not. Do not. You can edit this out if you like, AP. No, I'll, I'll keep it in, but I'm going to put a big warning up saying, do not put your hand over a candle. This is an analogy to explain something. No one is telling you to do this. You should not do it. It will result in harm. I'll probably have to put a huge disclaimer over the whole thing. Great. Okay, well, don't pull stones out of dams either, okay? Don't go to the base of dams and pull stones out of there either. Don't do that. <laughs> I think I was slightly more careful about how I framed it as a hypothetical. <laughs> I mightn't have been. <laughs> I will have to listen back to the recording at some point. So when, when it came to designing the, the warrants, uh, when you and Erickson were, were trying to build all of this out, um, did you start with, well, these are the core ones that we're going to use, or was it, uh, tried to design the system first and go, right, we're going to have these ones and then we're going to add in these ones. Or was it built on an ad hoc that you designed some and then you went, oh, it'd be interesting if this thing was added as well. Like, mm. I, how did you go about that? Um, I think they were all, it was all set up during the gaming, pretty much. Yeah, it had prior, mostly. I think Steve found that he wanted to add a couple things afterwards and we, we talked about it. Um, but I, my understanding, and I might be wrong, is that we had most of this, all, the framework already established, uh, and we just explored it and further in, in the uh, novelizations and the, the creation that came, uh, came afterwards. Yeah, because I assume that you go, oh, it's this thing, and you go, well, it'd be really interesting. We never actually went there in the games. I'm going to have a character do that. And then having right, to clear sure. it with, or discuss it with the other, the other author to go, I'm thinking of doing this. This is what I'm thinking of doing. Is that okay? Or do you need it? Like, what have, what have you said about it? Yeah, we had to find out if uh, the other person was there as well. And, and it was more like, I'm going to do this now. And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> was, that, was more the, that was more the approach. Um, but what, why, why did you go the elemental route? You know, well, again, often... that just, it comes out of, um, I think, you know, Norse mythology and, and the earlier, earlier mythologies of various regions and cultures. Um, the I, I, and um, for example, some cultures have the idea that um, ghosts are among us, right? That's a very common view. It's a pagan, pre Christian, um, Chthonic. And we saw a very rich spiritual environment. So we wanted to have that. And, uh, and that's one thing that, that I really, really enjoyed and wanted to explore. Uh, uh, and there's that. And then uh, in, in that set of beliefs, the afterlife is often an actual physical place that you can go to, uh, you know, Orpheus uh, visits the realms of the dead, and uh, and so it is Gilgamesh. Actually, he he visits the the land of the dead, uh, and so the, this is all it's all out there. We just um, exploited it <laughs> because it's. I think sometimes when we we think about these aspects of what magic is that we can become overly concerned with the the surface level detail um you open a portal well how do the edges of the portal work how does it fit in this thing how would it interact with that object there's lots of speculation about um edge cases um instead of yeah it it's a portal it's in a fictional world this doesn't exist it hasn't been tested that it, it doesn't have and cannot bear the same scrutiny that an actual thing can. And even then, there are lots of actual things in our world that we think bear this kind of scrutiny. And yet when it gets to the edge cases, things kind of fall apart and get a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, uh, and if you're um, writing or, or exploring world building, I mean, even in um, Zelay's and Amber series, uh, everyone in that universe believed that you could, you had to have a car to um, travel and, and, and summon an image and step into that image in order to travel between uh, dimensions or realities. Uh, but then Corwin is in a, a jail cell and he just draws a picture on the wall uh, and then uses that as a card. So ex there, there we are. Ex people just didn't think of it, that's all. Uh, but he was the one who was willing and, and daring enough to make that step, to step into that. Who knows where it would have taken him. He might have just disappeared entirely from reality uh, because it was an incomplete connection. Or who knows? But he was willing to try. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, it's an interesting aspect of fantasy writing. I once described a lot of fantasy worlds as being these worlds that are trapped in amber in that the outside of it continues to age and weather, but the inside remains static because it is very difficult to, A, create a world, say that this is the system and, and how the world works to describe in a way that is understandable and appreciated by a reader. And I go, yeah, and this system continues to evolve. And like our world, not everyone understands the system the same way and not everyone uh, appreciates it the same way. And people can be mistaken. And as soon as you start trying to apply all of those layers of authenticity and then start aging the world and have developments in one area that are not necessarily replicated in another area, for a reader looking in, this increases the complexity of the reality almost exponentially, but at the same time is actually far more reflective of the real world. And yet that can be difficult for us to wrap our heads around because of the assumption we have once the rules are explained these are the rules of how the thing functions and they will never change and that is a th there's a more organic feel to a lot of the stuff in Malazan because I think part of it is the information given to the reader is so frequently from the position of a mere mortal who is explaining how they understand it. And they don't have an omniscient overview of the mechanics of the universe. They have it from a user end experience going, this is how this website works. And they're trying to describe what's happening in the background that you can't see. It's also, it's approach as well. I mean, a lot of readers um, might say, be very familiar with um, science fiction. And, and are, are used to that kind of uh, um, writing. And so in, in science fiction, it's often the goal is to explore a particular physics problem or to explore a certain issue in, in science and, and play it out in an, in a, with a, a, what's called a, a problem piece, I think is what it's called, uh, a short story or a novel. Uh, and so that's the whole purpose of the story that's being told is to explore this particular element of physics and how it works uh, and the limitations that you encounter with it and how you could try and overcome it. Um, and, but that's, that's that approach. That's not our approach. We're not trying to explore these issues and uh, exploit them or uh, explain them even. Um, it's more about um, like us in the, in the world, we don't understand how a lot of things work, but we still use them. <laughs> well, clearly neither one of us actually understands how the internet works because we always <laughs> end up with these don't. calls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Most definitely. But uh, like, I, I am curious, is, is there a, is there a limitation on what can be accomplished with the the different types of magic in the Malazan world? In in that, if you are say a practitioner of dark, are you limited to effects that are associated with dark, or is that just the form that the energy is taking? Where you're taking energy, like could you still create a fireball using energy from 
uh, Elemental Knight? Hmm. Or is that anathema to Elemental Knight? Yeah, that's, I would think that it's up to the um, individual's imagination. Um, you know, if you can visualize, if you could think of a ball of black flame, uh, it might not burn anything, but uh, it, 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 there's, uh, the, the limitations are only um, upon the individual and they're self-imposed. Um, that would be my take of it. Um, but there are also, <clears throat> when you start getting into really big issues, you know, like in geopolitics, when uh, some country emerges and is, has lots of power, well, the other countries get concerned. And they, <laughs> there, you know, there are larger issues uh, where uh, people who already possess power will be uh, worried about some new emergent uh, and uh, make sure that they can control what, what's going on. Yeah, no, I, I, it was just one of those questions that uh, sort of popped into my head because when we, when we think of like, trying to nail down something that doesn't actually exist, cannot exist, cannot be tested, that you're mm -hmm. constantly trying to think of where the edges of it are, or at least the edges of it that you can see. And you go, there, there may be other stuff back there, but we haven't gotten there yet. We'll, we'll see where it goes. But in, in trying to, to do a lot of these things, it, and it happens frequently when we are watching TV shows or watching films and, and reading books, you go, well, why didn't they just do this thing with it? And this was a, it reminded me a lot of the mechanical approach that we see in computer gaming, where someone finds an exploit where they go, you know, this spell that you can cast. If you cast that spell on that person while they're casting that spell on you, the computer basically has a meltdown and creates a, uh, an effect bouncing between them that will annihilate any enemy. You go, right. Okay, and it, you know, in narrative terms, you can actually create a really interesting scene out of that. But I don't think anyone approaches uh, the design of their system specifically to create effects like that. So that's why I was thinking about it in, in terms of, you know, the, the sea ma magic associated with water in the sea. And then we think of the natural connotations that we have with it, associating it with the moon and uh, associating it with movements of the moon. And maybe that is viewed as, because it is life-giving, uh, is more associated with healing. Whereas fire, we think of as destructive and therefore combat oriented and yet fire can warm and that could then be healing and a tsunami coming in to wipe people out is destructive that there are all these different ways of conceiving of the sure. thing um and I'm, I'm always fascinated by how people play with elemental designations sure and our uh classical four elements that's just a conceit i mean that's just a cultural view there are other you know elementals elements that, that could be invented and and other cultures see them that we in the west might not see uh there's so you can do all kinds of in, inventive things uh, i think that a lot of uh fantasy some fantasy series are actually created to, in order to explore these things that's the whole point of the series. You know, how far can I take this? And uh, almost like a thought experiment. Um, and uh, some readers might be used to approaching worlds and, and uh, magic and the systems that way. But that's not what um, we, Steve and I are, are, are doing. <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, I, the, like one of the, the funniest things that I, I remember being pointed out to me was, you know, uh, one of the characters in the Marvel movies is the Winter Soldier, and he has like a, a cyborg arm that allows him to crush things, and it makes it like he can lift up a car. And you go, he has a cyborg arm. He doesn't have a, a cyborg collarbone. He doesn't have a cyborg spine. He doesn't have cyborg legs. So how is he lifting a car? The transference of force would rip, would put all of the pressure on the joint of how the arm is joined to his body and would rip it off. Yes, yes, yes. And you go, right, so if that is how you approach magic or any of these films if you take that literal this is happening in our world according to our physics it is shredding the 
narrative conceit that these things exist, that there has to be a willingness to extend, right? This couldn't exist in the real world, which is why it's called fantasy or science fiction. But we're going to allow the, this world for that to exist. But people insist on going, well, okay, that's fine. But how much can he then lift? And you go, it's still the same mindset that people are still plugging into this very literal, realist, materialist dissection instead of, and it's not hand waving. It's not just going, you can let anything happen. Oh, because it's just a story. But there has to be flexibility in approach because no magic system that I can think of ever stands up to that level of scrutiny mm. because it is the wrong type of scrutiny. It is focused on, in, on things that you cannot ever prove sufficiently. Mm -hmm. um, it is asking for evidence that if an author provided it, would kill any story that you were trying to read. <laughs> Kill the myth. Um, yeah, wh right. In, if you're reading fiction, it's the, of course, it's the willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah. Like the reader is a, or viewer is a participant and their, their contribution is this willing suspension for, for a certain amount of time. It's like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll run, we'll go with that for now. See, see how, how it plays out. Uh, you know, like, way back in the day the the storyteller around the fire says long ago and then someone says how long exactly said, well a long time how long how long three days 10 days well, I, a very long time before i was born um yes before you were born before my dad was born um yes before your dad was born, there was was a who is this guy? Where is he from? Is he from this land? Well, let wait. Let me <laughs> calm. There is no reason to tell everyone about our first conversation. <laughs> but yeah, we. I I think that is a, a perfect illustration of this. They not wanting to just wait and find out, not wanting everything explained up front. But what you personally want explained up front is not necessarily what the person sitting next to you would want explained up front. And no story, well, it is very rare that a story is written specifically for you personally. No, that it may be a case that you and, and Ericsson have written stories and put things in it deliberately to wind or, or joke with the other person. But stories are, are written with a more general audience. And I think sometimes, particularly in modern society, we've become hyper-focused on, well, this is what I want. You go, yes, but we are part of a much bigger class of narrative that this story is being narrated to. And no author or writer can ever cater to all of our whims. And it's mm -hmm. a, they're aiming at a specific level or a certain level and going, you know, it, I, I'm trying to do this thing. This is the story I am telling. And these are the, the frameworks of, of my story. So um, I think for Stephen, I, I, I believe is it's a tool. Um, it's, the, you know, the magic, the magic system, all this. It's just a tool that we're using to tell a story. And we're coming at it from a novelistic approach and so at the end the tools that you're using and the effects that were created and and the uses that they were employed in in the the narrative has to serve that ending uh and it has to so the poetics are actually the overriding determinant like did it work or not was it is it emotionally satisfying um you know and that's really the 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 measure uh, and all these things are just there to contribute to, to that. Yeah, and one of the, I suppose, one of the things is magic, particularly in fantasy, can be used to create spectacle. But if it is always used just to create spectacle, it becomes um, tired. 
and if it is always used to solve every problem, it, it, sometimes think yeah, of it as the it's Superman. It's emotionally satisfying. If yeah, it's but, always, yeah. And I, I sometimes think of it almost like the, the Superman problem, where you know Superman is so powerful and so strong that they invented a bunch of hero or uh, villains who are just as powerful and just as strong. And you go, right? So I'm watching these two invulnerable, essentially immortal people beat each other up for. 20 minutes this isn't yeah. exciting because sure. yeah. this is not the resolution of anything yeah they're destroying everything around them yes it's spectacle it's lots of things happening on screen but ultimately nothing is happening because no resolution comes from that that is just stuff what the the stories with Superman that always uh, the one that really impressed me the most was actually an Elseworlds story, uh, Superman Red Sun, where it's about how Lex Luthor outthinks Superman, and that <laughs> to me is a much more satisfying story because it's not about resolving the story by punching each other in the face, which so many superhero stories degenerate into. Here's the big climactic action sequence where lots of people are fighting. And then we there's a duel between two special heroes or villains in the middle. And it, it becomes that very repetitive structure. Whereas Superman Red Sun didn't go that way. It, it was such a, an entirely different thing. So when I think in the sure. Malazan Book of the Fallen, you go, oh, well, you could just, why don't they just use magic all the time? You go, well, well, that's oh, the Superman you. problem, yeah. And I, yeah, sure, I'd agree with that. And um, <clears throat> why not just use it all the time? Um, yeah. It, so if you are working with uh, energy and, and using magic as just, it's really just an analogy for energy. It's, it's really what it is, uh, at least in our world. Um, it, there's a cost. Uh, and there has to be costs for everything. And that cost is um, you are burning up your life force. So that this is, that's why they're not using it all the time. Or you are calling attention to yourself and someone else might decide that uh, you're a threat uh, and uh, come and destroy you. So everybody's got their head down and they're watching each other and uh, it's much more real politic that way. Uh, and so that's why, I, and, and I really uh, like the, the Superman problem thing. Yeah, and that's why Spider-Man was such a revelation uh, because he was vulnerable and he was uh, flawed. He had, he had weaknesses and flaws and, so that, and he was a much more interesting character for that reason. Yeah, and I think actually with the, the spate of a lot of the superhero films and tv shows one of my favorites was the the first season of netflix's daredevil because in that matt murdoch is it, like, there's a brilliant fight sequence where he starts fighting and then you can see that halfway through he's he's taking a moment to catch his breath he's leaning to rest because he he's constantly fighting and he doesn't have superhuman endurance and we then see the damage that he takes. And it was such a sharp contrast to so many of the other sort of big budget superhero stories. And yet, if every superhero story did it that way, I long for a superhero story that was told in that grand manner. It's, it's about variety that I think if every fantasy story used magic the same way and took the same approach and used the same focus, that it would become very stale very, very quickly. Yeah. And yeah. I like the variety of different approaches to how to integrate it into the world and how to use it. How much of the story focuses on it? How much the use the narrative yeah. makes of it? Yeah. Uh, when you were giving the example of Daredevil and um, having, uh, <clears throat> you know, reaching the edge of his endurance and having to rest and all that, what came to mind for me was in the traditional Hollywood um, the people never reloaded their guns. Um, you, they would just keep shooting all shooting, shooting all the time, you know, infinite ammo. 
Uh, and um, there was some wonderful studies where people demonstrated that, you know, how long would it take to empty an Uzi or, uh, and, and so you fired one off on full automatic, it took two seconds. That was it. They're out, you know, that was it. They're out of bullets. And but that's not much of an interesting firefight, right? A two second firefight. That's, that's just not, you're not getting the audience's attention. So now, of course, it's actually interesting to see that some of these action movies are paying attention to that. And you're seeing people having to reload or throw their weapons because they're useless now and things like that. But, and again, like, but even in those, those films, quite often, they still have scenes where they have infinite bullets. It's when it's narratively inconvenient for the character. It's a click. Oh, well, oh. it wasn't that lucky it happened just right. at that moment. That's right. That's right. Funny. Now that I have you at my mercy, suddenly I'm out of ammo. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's one of the things that I love about the film Predator back in the 80s, back in the heyday of the 80s action movie was, right, looking at it now, we know it's science fiction, but when it was sort of first bit, it was billed as this uh, 80s action, maybe a bit of element of horror, that sort of thing. But we're meant to believe in it as really our world. It's, it's meant to be our world adjacent. And yet this guy is going to trip through the jungle with a minigun, a weapon that is designed to be mounted on a vehicle that requires a giant battery to operate and masses of ammunition that would burn out in seconds. And even then, the recoil from this, the reason it's mounted on a vehicle is the recoil is so great that you couldn't use it or aim it. And you go, yes. But ignoring the physics for a second, it's really cool when Jesse the Body Ventura, playing Blade, mows down a rainforest with a minigun. It, and it makes no sense, no logical sense, rational sense, to be carrying a weapon like that into, yes, we're going to trek through the jungle and I'm going to hold it while I fire. There is no way that that is a sensible, rational, logical decision. And yet, who cares? It's a story. And each of the, the different characters had slightly different weapons because it makes them distinct. And we tie that into their characterization. It's yeah. all part of the narrative compact of willing suspension of disbelief. And I think... And even to, to put a slightly uh, even different note on that, uh, I have read that uh, the director, um, Tiernan, actually intended that scene to be a parody of a firefight. <laughs> he was, he, he was, he wanted to make fun of these gigantic firefights. And so the whole thing was just a, a setup and a, a sh to show how stupid it is. Uh, and yet people took it at face value and went, wow, that's just great. I love it. <laughs> you go, I need to hire some gardeners to, to do some gardening and cut down these trees. No, no, no. We're going to send in a squad and they're just going to shoot down the trees. <laughs> but the weird thing is the, the expectation that fantasy or science fiction function like realist fiction. There are fantasies and science fictions that work that way, that lean into that. But I think the expectation that they all do that, you go, where I, I don't understand where that expectation is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, way back in the Ur proto frames, um, you know, Beowulf um, fights <clears throat> uh, Grendel's mother in, in the swamp underwater for three days, I think. I think he was underwater for three days fighting her. And so, well, wait a minute, how can that be? <laughs> uh, or, or what about his story about how he swam across the, uh, the ocean fighting the sea serpents? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think he might be telling tall tales. Maybe it didn't happen that way. Y you think? Yeah, but <laughs> is it a good story? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Cameron, thank you. Thank you very much for taking this time. And I appreciate the fact that the internet connection, I, why, why is it as soon as we arrange to meet to record, the internet connection just gets terrible. And other times when we're, we're meeting to chat about other things uh, with no intention of recording, 
it's absolutely fine and picture perfect. Yeah, everyone chooses this moment to start working remotely, I think, is, is what happens so here, here around me. Uh, but <laughs> thank you very much for taking the time. Thank, thanks for having this conversation. Well, thank uh, you, Abe. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And for those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.